thanks for the introduction, Dave. Um, so today I will be discussing uh, some aspects of gene expression and gene regulation. Um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge a colleague of mine uh, back at our home base, um, Caroline Beltran, uh, who kindly put these slides together. I've uh, updated the slides and uh, added my own twist to it, so I hope you enjoy. Um, I think it'll be best if uh, we go through the lecture and then if you have any questions at the end, we can always rewind and uh, clarify anything that's unclear. But if there's something that's really blocking your mind at the time, just stick up your hand and I'll try my best to assist you guys. Okay, so we are primarily interested in measuring uh, gene expression. So before we jump into gene expression and how that works, I just want to set the scene and go back to the central dogma. So the central dogma, as I'm sure most of you are aware, consists of uh, your DNA inside, the, inside your cells being uh, transcribed into RNA, and that RNA is then translated into proteins. So the formation of functional proteins starts with a transcript which is known as RNA um, and these are encoded through the uh, functional units of DNA known as genes and the, these genes are transcribed into mRNA. So in a particular organism uh, all cells contain the same set of genes so they have the same blueprints but these are switched on and off uh, for different types of cells, right? So we all have the same amount of uh, genes, but based on the cell, we'll have some genes that are upregulated, some genes that are downregulated, and some genes that are just kept at a constant level throughout. So within a particular organism, uh, gene expression is dynamic, right? It's constantly changing. It's changing based on what type of cell it is, it's changing on the environment, and it's changing based on what stage in the developmental cycle uh, the particular cell or organism might be in. Um, so this means that the genes are expressed at different levels or quantities at different times, and we often like to investigate this to know what exactly is happening. So we have examples here of um, a gene that is expressed uh, under different conditions and uh, RNA can be expressed uh, at different times and under different conditions and can also undergo RNA editing, modification or what's known as alternative splicing. So what exactly is alternative splicing? So if you look at the example there on the bottom right, you'll have your uh, functional units of your DNA, your, your exons, your genes, and uh, those correspond to uh, different R mRNA transcripts, right? So you have one, two, three, four. So if they're transcribed in the appropriate sequence, you'll read it one, two, three, four. However, you can get a phenomenon which is known as alternative splicing, whereby the order of those transcripts are shuffled up. And then you would get a one, two, four, um, transcript. And when that eventually gets translated, that will mean that it's a completely different protein. So this, this phenomenon of um, al uh, alternative splicing is a way that um, transcript components can be uh, mod further, further modified uh, in the biological process. We have different layers of quantification. So you can either look at a, you, in your particular system where you're looking at how genes are expressed and looking at RNA, you can either look at it at a cell level, a tissue level, or a whole organism level. Typically, when we work in the lab, we're working at a cell level, or a collection of cells at tissue level, and we're looking at RNA that is representative of a collection of cells or a single cell. So when we talk about quantifying gene expression, we refer to the collection of transcripts uh, as something known as the transcriptome, or the collection of RNA, um, different types of RNA molecules. So you get the, the classic uh, coding mRNA. So this is something, this is an RNA that's been transcribed from a particular gene, and it codes for a certain 
peptide or protein function, right? So um, that's coding mRNA. Then you also get different types of non-coding RNA. So these are RNAs that don't necessarily get translated into proteins at the end of the day, but they help facilitate the function of the inside the cell. So you get um, rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA, and this uh, type of RNA is involved inside the ribosomal complex and helps facilitate uh, translation from your mRNA transcripts uh, to your final peptide or protein product. You also get uh, tRNA or transfer RNA, which is very important for taking, decoding the mRNA and essentially assembling the amino acids uh, inside the ribosomal complex to eventually form your peptides or your protein. And then you get short and, non uh, short and long non-coding RNAs. And these generally have a, a regulatory function, so they can, they kind of, they, they kind of have the last say in whether or not uh, a, a particular um, transcript is going to be um, ultimately translated or not. Okay, so an example of uh, an interesting RNA that has a uh, functional component inside the cell but is not, um, is not translated is uh, the gene expression of the exist RNA. Um, and how exist works is, I'm sure you're all familiar that uh, females in the human species have two X chromosomes and during their developmental life, uh, life, uh, lifetime uh, in early development, uh, there is a phenomenon known as X chromosome inactivation, whereby one X chromosome gets switched off and one stays on. And it forms this sort of functional mosaic with some of the cells having one X chromosome switched on and another cell having it switched off. And this exist RNA is one of the key components that helps drive this biological phenomenon uh, in female mammals. And uh, how it works is that there is a um, XIC uh, region on the X chromosome, and this encodes uh, the um, exist RNA uh, component. This is then transcribed, and this exist RNA then accumulates in large quantities and adheres, it sticks to the X chromosome. And this interacts with a number of other proteins and in the system effectively is the starting point in the X chromosome inactivation. And what we know from observations of one of, this, uh, one of these striking examples of uh, regulatory RNA is that uh, if you attach fluorescent probes, you can then see uh, in different cells, cells that are inactive, uh, uh, that have inactive uh, X chromosomes, uh, have this exist RNA fully coating the chromosome and those that are active and transcribing and, uh, yeah, and fully transcribing do not have this coating. So this is just one of the, one of the early and most striking examples of, of the central dogma and then saying, hey, RNA actually has a lot more of a regulatory function than we initially thought. Okay, so there are a bunch of methods we can use when we are looking at the transcriptome. So, uh, some of these tools we call um, tr uh, transcriptomics, so in, in the field of the transcriptome, the, the tools we're going to apply. And they broadly divide it into two very broad categories. So the first is a targeted method, so this typically uses a technique known as uh, northern blots. Some of you might have encountered this before. And then the other technique is um, reverse transcriptase quantitative uh, real-time PCR. Uh, and the northern blot looks at typically uh, single genes, and then your um, RTQ-PCR uh, can look at single genes, but often we're looking at multiple genes. So how the northern blot works is uh, you have your RNA, um, you run it, uh, you electrophoresis it so it separates based, uh, based on its size. You'll get different sizes of your RNA which correspond to different bands. You transfer these bands onto a membrane. Uh, these, this membrane can then be exposed to different uh, probes that recognize um, 
the, uh, the target and these probes generally have a fluorescent signal and you can visualize it so you can see, okay, is a particular uh, gene that I'm looking at, is it being switched on, is it being switched off. Uh, then you can also do um, quantitative uh, reverse transcriptase uh, qPCR. We'll get into that a little bit later, but effectively what you do is you take a snapshot of a particular cell, you harvest all the RNA, you uh, expose it to an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which takes the RNA and converts it back into cDNA, and uh, you can then design a number of um, DNA uh, primers, uh, that recognize the particular sequence that you're looking at and amplify that up and then see relative to a reference gene hey, is the gene I'm looking at, is it being switched on or switched off? Is there more of it or less, less of it for a particular condition? The other type of transcriptomic tool we have is what's called untargeted. Uh, and this is generally much bigger in scope. This is a global analysis of expression profiles. So we're looking at a number of genes Together, it's usually a whole suite of different genes within an organism. So you're not, look, you're, not, you're not asking one particular gene, you say, how are these genes interacting with each other in a network for a particular condition? So the most common tool we implement here is what's called gene microarrays. And uh, I'll have an explanation in, in a couple slides how this works, but essentially what you have is you have uh, your, D, your DNA probes for a particular gene are immobilized uh, onto a membrane surface. The nature of these probes requires uh, what's known as a priori sequence information, so you need to know the sequence, the exact sequence of what you're looking at in order to design these probes, so you need to have sequence information. And this does have a limited dynamic range, so it's it can tell you on off, but it can't tell you if it's a very small percentage on or off. Um, so it's, 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 it's a little bit fuzzy in that respect. Then we also have uh, RNA sequencing, which uses whole tr transcriptome shotgun sequencing, uh, using your next generation sequencing uh, platform of choice uh, on any cDNA that you make. So I'll be going through some of these techniques uh, in a bit. So we're going to start with uh, microarrays. <coughs> Sorry, let me just get to the picture. So essentially what we have here is, let's say you're looking at, you're a farmer, or you're, you're in agricultural research and you're looking at a particular type of grape. And you want to see, okay, can this grape survive under really hot conditions? So you'll have, you'll design your experiment such that you have the same type of grape, um, two, two separate plants, one grown up at, say, your room temperature or the normal ambient temperature it's used to growing at outside, and then one at a temperature that you've uh, artificially created, say, at 38 degrees, exceedingly hot. And you want to see, okay, during the hot conditions, what genes are switched on compared to when it's at its normal conditions. So what you would do then is you would have your control experiment, which is at room temperature, and then your experiment, your actual experiment, which is at the hotter temperature. You would then isolate the plant material from that, um, process the cells, and then extract the RNA uh, in those cells, which is a reflection of the gene expression at the time, right? So in this example, the uh, green cells are your control experiment at room temperature, and your reds and your red cells are uh, your um, uh, experimental conditions, so the, the hot condition. You use um, reverse transcriptase on the RNA to um, uh, convert the RNA into your uh, cDNA, and then you um, hybridize, uh, so sorry, then you, then you combine it with, um, the cDNA has probes on it which will fluoresce either for your green fluorescence or your red fluorescence based on your control condition or your experimental condition. You then hybridize uh, this cDNA with the fluorescent probe mix uh, onto a membrane. And then there are lasers that um, excite at both the red and the green um, frequencies. And uh, then signals are produced. So effectively you get 
then two panels, the panel on the left, the green panel, and the panel on the right, the red panel. And typically, the, your, red, your red color fluorescent corresponds to upregulation, and your green would correspond to downregulation. So genes being um, switched on in response to heat, or genes being uh, switched off in response to heat. And then the, the black is the middle ground where there's actually no change and it's a middle ground. What happens is you overlay these two microarray images and you get the picture of what's happening in both scenarios. And each of those dots on the grid corresponds to a gene target of choice. So you could map the, the top left one might be uh, switched on. It might be some heat, um, heat, heat tolerance related gene. And that might be expected. Whereas some of the, um, the black ones might be uh, involved in unrelated biological processes that are just switched on all the time. However, there might be, say in the bottom left, there's a green one that's down-regulated. That might be a protein that is maybe uh, involved with water uptake, and maybe when the organism is hot, that those genes would switch off, and that makes sense in the biological context. So you can have these, the, this grid is quite small, you can have a massive grid and you have software that maps what each dot means in terms of its gene target and you can really get a sense of, for a particular condition, what's, what genes are being switched on and what are being switched off. So just to summarize um, the microarrays, so you do need to know the sequence that is already known because your DNA probes used in microarray require sequence information to be, to be synthesized. You can look at thousands of genes, so these grids can have thousands of little dots on them. Um, your DNA fragments, or your probes, uh, the, the little circles, each correspond to an individual gene. Um, and your cDNA that you've synthesized from your RNA, which is your snapshots of what's happening in the cell, uh, is labeled with different dyes that are hybridized. Um, and then the gene expression is a combination of the the different fluorescent uh, signals. It uh, uses cross-hybridization in order to get onto the membrane. Uh, and as I mentioned, you need, you need to know the sequence information in order to design the probes. Um, and it is very difficult to detect low expression of genes. So if you have genes that are just, just they're in low abundance normally, and they're only expressed by less than twofold, you sometimes have difficulty figuring out if they're actually switched on. So instead of having a red signal, you might have a black signal. So it's not as sensitive as we'd like, but it, it definitely shows us a lot of in insights. Okay, so the next technique we're looking at is uh, RNA sequencing. So this is actually taking your RNA, your, your transcriptome, what's happening in the cell in terms of gene expression, and physically sequencing that. So the technique we use there is uh, called uh, whole transcriptome shotgun sequencing. And this is a representative of the entire transcriptome. So it's all the different types of RNA. It's your, your mRNA, your tRNA, your rRNA, your non-coding. And it also takes into account any splicing events that have happened or any post-transcriptional modifications. So that's the whole lot. It's exceedingly powerful because you can actually get down to uh, individual nucleotides. So you can see uh, mutations, so if, if there are any mutations uh, occurring in, in the uh, transcripts, uh, right down to single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is one nucleotide uh, altered compared to the wild type. Uh, any insertion, so that's a bunch of nucleotides being put in compared to uh, a, a, a standard a, a reference a reference organism or a reference gene, and then also deletion, so that it, they can happen that entire portions of nucleotides are just removed. And that confers all kinds of interesting functions. You can also get an idea of copy number variations, so there might be different numbers of copies uh, in different organisms or strains. So if, you, if you're talking about the grape example, there might be different strains of grape that have um, different copy numbers, um, and they've evolved that way. Uh, and then you can also you can also gain insights into events like uh, chromosomal rearrangements, and we've gone through uh, some of the examples of interesting things that happen to chromosomes thanks to RNA. The great thing about RNA sequencing compared to microarrays is you need very very small amounts of RNA material. 
uh, in order to do this technique. So you need only about 100 nanograms of RNA. And as technology is improving, that number is actually getting less and less. But it's a bit of a double-edged sword in that when you're working with a transcriptome, because you're looking at a snapshot in time and a whole bunch of genes for a given organism, a lot of the times when you do transcriptome work, you get a lot of data out. So that's great because you have lots of questions uh, that you can answer, but sometimes when you get lots of data, you generate more questions and it's time to get answers. The awesome thing about RNA sequencing compared to something like microarrays is that it has a large dynamic range and it's very sensitive. So those fuzzy areas in the microarray where we had black segments and we weren't sure if that was actually up-regulated, down-regulated, stayed the same, you can get a lot more resolution with your RNA sequencing. So when we talk about RNA sequencing, uh, we use the RNA-seq uh, workflow, and there are three main components. So your first component is preparing your library. Your second one is uh, actually doing the sequencing using your sequencing platform of choice. And then the last component is actually analyzing your transcriptomic data. So I'm just going to run you through the, the, the normal pipeline. So you start off with your library preparation. And this <coughs> consists of the most important step, the RNA isolation. So typically, um, if, you're, if you're isolating RNA from a system, if you're working with cells, you need some kind of way to lyse the cells, so to make them pop so you can get inside the cell to get all to, to the juicy um, nucleotide, the, the, the RNA. However, it's not that simple. There's a lot of, there's a lot of other material inside a given cell, um, and DNA is a very big component. Now, because you're going to be converting a lot of times to cDNA, you want to make sure that before you convert to cDNA, you wipe out any DNA, and you're only working with pure RNA in the first place. So we incorporate what's called DNAs, which is simply an enzyme that eats up any DNA in a particular solution. So we apply DNAs. What that does is it chomps up all the DNA and it leaves just RNA behind. Uh, then we measure the RNA quantity. So we use what's called a RIN score or RNA integrity number. And there's a bunch of different systems and nice kits that now have really streamlined uh, you being able to uh, set up your reaction such that you can measure your RIN score and it gives you a range, uh, the different kits give you a different range. Generally a higher RIN score means you have a more pure or high quality specimen, a lower RIN score means you have lower quality RNA. Um, and based on that RIN score you can have a certain amount of confidence about how, much, how good your quality is of your RNA is going into the system. Remember, for any system, junk in, junk out. So if you put good quality stuff in, at the end of the day, if you do everything properly, you'll get good uh, quality stuff out. Same applies to RNA and the RIN score. And then, of course, what we're interested in doing is quantifying this RNA to get an idea of well, what genes are being expressed, right? We can also get an idea of RNA selection and depletion. Bear in mind that for most cells, the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA, constitutes about 90% of the RNA population. And this RNA population is as is. So this is a snapshot in time. You're looking at what, what it is at that moment. Uh, there are also factors like uh, poly A tails uh, selection. So generally, uh, mature mRNAs have this um, poly A tail cap to a whole bunch of adenosines. Um, at the end, um, and uh, that, that's also a component. Then you can also get an idea of ribosomal depletion. So as I mentioned, there are certain ratios of the RNA populations. If those ratios are not in keeping to what's expected, you know something's amiss, something's maybe happened in your treatment. Then the cDNA synthesis is incredibly important. So that's the process, like I mentioned before, where you use reverse transcriptase to convert your RNA that's now pure and clean to cDNA, which then can be sequenced. And then there are certain sequence purification uh, processes you can do to both the RNA and the final cDNA product. Um, and this generally helps remove uh, low quality sequences. Again, junk in, junk out. So you want really good, good uh, material. 
then there's a the sequencing component. Uh, I won't go too much into that. Uh, we, we will touch on that a little bit later and, and, and possibly in one of the practical exercises we do. But there are a number of uh, next generation sequencing platforms you can then use. And then comes the analysis, right? So you have all of these transcripts, these, these, um, this, 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 you're trying to quantify the gene expression, uh, but you need to be able to assemble it to make a, to make a picture, to make sense of all of these different transcripts that are floating around. So we have what's known as a de novo or sequence guided approach. Um, and a de novo approach um, does not require a reference uh, a reference sequence. So a lot of the times you're comparing, when you're doing assembly, you're comparing what I expect to what I've got and seeing how well they match up. So it's kind of like building a puzzle. Uh, with de novo sequence, you don't need to have a reference gene. You can use this for unknown, um, unknown species, um, specimens that haven't been checked before that perhaps don't have a reference sequence. Um, genome guided. Um, so this this basically uses the same. Uh, sorry, I've skipped ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. Sequence guided uh, basically uses the same approach as um, DNA sequence um, comparisons. So you have your your sequence. You compare it to something that's known, and you see how much how well it matches up. Um, then you can also do differential gene expression. So this is just seeing, okay, how many copies of each, uh, the number of reads that are mapped to a particular region or, or locus um, in the assembly. And then we can do what's called co-expression networks for functional analysis. And I'll get to that in the next slide. <coughs> So effectively what we have is we, we can have different samples that go through the RNA-seq platform and based on how we treat those samples we can get different, um, different processes out. So you can see in one example we, we're getting a, for the same, for one sample we're getting um, A, B and C expressed at a certain level and then with a different type of sample we're getting a completely different profile. So it's always good to bear in mind what your question is, and are you? Do you have a hypothesis of what you expect in terms of your expression profile? Are you are you putting in a certain condition, and do you expect certain genes to be up or down regulated, or is this exploratory? And you just don't know. Okay, so looking specifically at uh, co-expression networks. So typically, in our context, we use these co-expression networks um, for functional gene annotation and generally figuring out what is a disease-causing gene in a network of genes. Um, sometimes it's a bunch of genes put together, but other times it can be just a specific gene or a handful of genes that are part of a broader biological network that are either have mutations in them, so they've changed their function and they're not functioning how they should, or for various other reasons from the environment, their gene expression profile has been changed and now they are diseased compared to when those conditions are absent and they and they perhaps not overexpressed or underexpressed. Um, yeah, so that's that's the that's the network. Um, so just an overview of the pipeline. So if we if we look at the pipeline, it's this is a bit oversimplified, but it can it's applicable to anything you're looking at, right? So in this particular example, we had a fish. We're interested in the gill, um, and we want to know uh, what the expression profile is in this particular fish. It could be a plant. In human cases, it could be tissue, and you're looking at a, a disease a disease phenotype versus a healthy phenotype, and you want to see uh, what makes a disease phenotype different, what, what genes are being expressed, it's the same concept. So you would take your tissue uh, from your organism of choice, or your cell line of choice, uh, you do the, ex the appropriate extractions, and uh, be left with the RNA, the pure RNA that you're interested in. 
then we go on to the lipid preparation. So this involves isolating the RNA, so there are a bunch of things you can do there. I've mentioned DNAs to clean up the, um, the process. You, can also, uh, you also need to fragment the RNA so they um, separate it out. And then through the process of reverse trans transcriptase, you, once you have your purified fragmented RNA, you can then uh, convert that to cDNA and that can happily be sequenced uh, using your high throughput next generation sequencing platform of choice. Then you have your transcriptome assembly. So in this case, we're using the guided approach. So the top line is the green. You have a reference. You know what to expect. You have your sample conditions. And uh, you just essentially map it compared to the reference. And you can assemble the picture. Once you have that picture, you can then visualize it in a whole manner of different ways. Uh, the most popular way to do it at the moment are what's known as these heat maps, differential expression. So it usually uses the hot and cold principles with uh, red fiery colors being up and um, colder colors being down regulated and then colors in between being stable the same. So next comes bioinformatics which is a section where a lot of scientists fall short. So they've prepared uh, their RNA, they've done all the hard work, there's no junk, you've had good stuff going in, you've got good stuff coming out, now you get the data back, and now you need to figure out what to do with it. So a lot of the times the bioinformatics forms the bulk of your time because you just get so much information coming with so many different analytical techniques. However, there's a lot of very, very, very powerful, useful information you can get out of this. So it's highly complex. You're looking at, a lot of the times, hundreds of thousands of genes in a system. You're trying to figure out what's up, what's down, what's important, what's not. Uh, the quality control of the raw reads. Um, so again, it's that whole junk in, junk out. Uh, you need to bear in mind that your pre-processing pre is uh, very important in the context of bioinformatics as well. So you can do a number of um, filtering steps and trimming to make sure that your data is as clean as possible before you start your analysis. Uh, quality control of the mapping is exceedingly important. Um, quality, con quality control of the counts is also important and the various um, softwares, uh, packages that um, can guide users uh, as to what is good quality and what is bad. Statistical uh, analysis of different uh, differential expression. So there are a multitude of different statistical approaches, approaches out there. You need, to f you need to figure out what statistical method works best for you. Uh, there is no one size fits all. Uh, and many of the times the people that uh, provide the uh, sequencing platform have access uh, to advisors, um, biased statisticians, uh, and people that are working in this field very regularly that can guide, uh, guide, guide you in your experiments and your data analysis. Um, you also have multivariant statistical analysis, uh, or also vi uh, visualizing to assess the transcriptome wide effects among samples, right? So uh, you, you might get a variety of different uh, genes being up or down expressed, uh, up or down regulated, what does this actually mean? And a lot of the times it comes back to the biological insights. So when you have a list of genes that are up or down regulated that you think of particularly interest or might be driving the biological process, it's no good just regurgitating, oh, these, these top 10 genes were the most upregulated, these top 10 genes were the most downregulated. You need to take a look at those individual genes, do a little bit of research where possible on what those genes are, and try and figure out, in the context of your experiment or in the context of this disease condition, does it make sense that these genes are being switched on or switched off? And the tools we use for both bioinformatics and looking at the transcriptome are constantly evolving. I think of in terms of when I started as a scientist, a lot of the stuff I've just lectured you on when I was an undergrad were coming soon, future things. 
now it's standard technology and the technology is, is, is constantly evolving. It's getting, constantly getting faster, it's constantly getting easier, and it's getting cheaper as well, which opens a lot of very exciting avenues for, for young scientists to look at gene regulation. So an important aspect of any experiment, but uh, looking at uh, gene expression is no exception, is sample design. So, like any experiments in science, you need to ask, well, what is your research question, right? You need to have some form of hypothesis, some kind of idea of what you're asking, what are you looking at? Um, are you looking at two conditions? Are you looking at two phenotypes? Are you looking at two different populations? What, what exactly are you looking at in the context of gene expression? So an important place to start a lot of the times is uh, your tissue to target, right? So we've spoken about like the, the grapevine example, which is plant, right? But the different tissues within the plant, right? So are you looking specifically at the leaf, the stem, or the root? Or if you're looking in a, in a, in a human or mammalian context, uh, are you looking at different tissues? Are you looking at heart, liver, brain, um, etc.? And then, are you looking are, are you looking at homogeneous sampling? So, what a homogeneous sampling in this in this particular example means is that they have your specimens or or or, um, or research cohorts or patients uh, that you're investigating have a particular trait in common. So are they all of the same age? Are they perhaps all of the same sex? Are they perhaps all of the same HIV status? These are things that can um, uh, point you down to how much of a sample. Then there's the question of replicates. So we have biological and technical replicates. And the very simplified way to think of, of your replicates is your technical replicates, so you're taking the same biological replicates, the same sample, the same, the same grave, the same patient tissue, and you are taking that sample, the exact same sample, and you're running it through your system the exact same way every time, and you're seeing if your output's the same. If you, have if you have large variation in your output, you have what's called technical variation. And that means that the process you, you're, you're doing is not consistent. You want to have as little technical variation as possible, and having technical replicates, putting your specimen through the same system the exact same way in replicate, helps you make sure that when you expand it to biological replicates, which are looking at different individuals, that when you see that variation, you can be sure that it's, hey, that's not my technique that's doing it. That is the particular biological context that that organism was exposed to. And his, it's his or her um, gene expression profile is actually what we're seeing and not an artifact of maybe poor technical, um, technical prowess as a scientist or a poor system. We obviously are uh, very interested in the RNA yield, so you need to figure out how much RNA do I need and what kind of pre-processing steps I need and what checks and balances need to be implemented in order to assess how much RNA you're getting out of a particular experiment. Then the issue of RNA stabilization is very important. So um, RNA tends to degrade quite quickly. Often when we're looking at RNA experiments as a snapshot in time, RNA degrades naturally in the cells, but also in the environment it's not very stable. So it's very important that when you're working with RNA that you stabilize it. So one of the techniques you can use is known as snap freezing. So that is, you often use things like liquid nitrogen for rapid, rapid freezing and you get it, uh, you get it stored immediately at minus at minus 80 degrees Celsius. And that stops, that halts the whole degradation process of your RNA. You can also use a number of commercially available chemicals, um, some of which are RNA later and triazole. We use them quite commonly in the lab. And uh, they have components there that um, uh, it's not a permanent bi uh, binding situation, but they associate themselves with the RNA and they prevent the degradation process, which also 
make sure that your RNA remains intact. Because remember, if your RNA starts breaking down for a particular gene and it's suddenly gone, when you convert it to cDNA, there's nothing there to convert. So then when you do your downstream transcriptome analyses, you might see that all of a sudden it's gone in one condition and it is present in another. Does that mean it's downregulated or actually the, the RNA degraded and there was nothing to convert to cDNA in the first place? So making sure you act really quickly is important. So as I mentioned, RNA is not a stable molecule. So some key things to bear in mind when you work with RNA for gene expression experiments is that the success is dependent on the purity and the intact nature of the RNA. So if the RNA is degraded or of poor quality, you're going to have a poor quality experiment. Uh, and you have to act really quickly on the bench, and generally speaking, everything is at uh, cool temperatures, and you, you transfer things as quickly as possible, and you want to convert that RNA into cDNA as quickly as possible, within reason. Another component which is often overlooked, particularly in the early stages of transcriptomics, is the, um, the phenomenon of uh, RNAs being present. So RNAs are just are similar to DNAs, except they are enzymes that, that uh, break up RNA molecules. And RNAs are present everywhere in the environment, and even things like autoclaving your materials don't necessarily kill RNAs. So a lot of the times you have to order RNAs-free tubes and reagents that have been specially treated to make sure and guarantee that there are no RNAs that can inadvertently eat up your sample. Uh, in the tube before you uh, get ready with your transcriptomics experiments. So we're getting towards the end, nearly there guys. Um, so we're going to do a, a, a bottom-up a, a bottom approach um, about, around some core assumptions around uh, looking at gene expression. So we're going to start at the, uh, your, so we're working now kind of backwards. We look, we, if, you, if you go from your RNA-seq reads to your cDNA, right, so your cDNA, this represents the pool of RNA that, that, that you've created, right, so your cDNA is representative of all the RNA that you've converted. And some problems here, if you don't have good cDNA for your RNA-seq reads, is that you can fail to map reads to the correct gene and uh, you can have problems reading your cDNA fragments. Your cDNA was converted from your mRNA, right? And so therefore your cDNA is representative of what, what you had in your, in your RNA population, what genes are being expressed, right? So it's that whole junk in, junk out uh, scenario. If you lose any RNA during your extraction, then you're converting, you have less to convert at the end of the day. So you need to make sure that you're capturing all of the RNA, and all of the RNAs are of a good quality when you do cDNA conversion. Your mRNAs, generally speaking, are representative of what is happening at a protein level, right? So you're looking at these genes, they're being expressed as RNA, and eventually that RNA is going to be translated into proteins, right, which are the sort of effectors of most cells. So most of the time, your mRNA can act as a proxy, not 100%, but a proxy to what's happening at a protein level. So it's a proxy for, for, for protein expression. That said, there are a couple of buts in that statement. So mRNA templates also have different speeds of protein degradation, even inside the cell, even when you're not doing it in a tube or whatever, even in a cell or in the tube, there are different rates of mRNA degradation. Um, and you also have uh, to factor in alternative splicing if you've gone through. So that means you're expecting protein A from this particular mRNA transcript, but in the natural biological process, alternative splicing might have happened. So instead of getting protein A out, you actually get protein B out. So if you're expecting 100 units of protein A and you only get 50 units of protein A, maybe you should also look for protein B as well, which might be because of your alternative splicing. 
then once you have your, you know, once you have proteins in a biological context, that generally defines the phenotype, right? So the proteins are sort of like the functional units of the cell. They really drive a lot of uh, the destiny of a particular cell and what an organism is ultimately going to look like, how it's going to react. Um, so that's the phenotype that you can physically see in the cell or organism. Um, and protein activity within a cell, within a biological system, is also highly regulated. So two of the uh, most common examples are proteins being phosphorylated to be either switched on or off in a particular function. And you can, they can often be involved in a lot of phosphorylation cascade chains, uh, very complicated biological networks. And then you also have the process of ubiquitination, where proteins get tagged for degradation as well, to make sure that no resources are being lost in a particular system. Right, so if you want to zoom into a single cell, so a lot of these examples I was talking about is you have like an entire, uh, a whole bunch of heart cells or a particular uh, grape seeds or grape plant that all gets mushed up and you extract the RNA and that's a collection of a whole bunch of cells. You can also zoom right into a uh, single cell RNA-seq. Um, so this is a, a relatively a, a newer technology by comparison to the other things that I've described. Um, and it's, it, it's, it, it falls under bulk sequencing and um, it's representative of the average expression uh, profile for all the, the cells that you're investigating. It has some limitations on it. It's, uh, it can fail to identify a change in the expression profile uh, is due to the regulation that's happening inside or is it something that's uh, related to a dominant population. So it's difficult to discern what's happening sometimes at an individual cell level or uh, if a dominant cell type is taking over. It's difficult to pick out what's happening in that one cell. But this technology is improving and it's getting far more sensitive day by day. Um, so this effectively can get down to RNS um, profiling for single cells. Uh, and that's exceedingly important when you think about in terms of disease being one of the most common applications for science. Um, if you're looking in, say, in the context of cancer, uh, you might have a particular tissue type like a liver. Uh, that has uh, areas, nodes, where there's cancer and areas where there are not. You might want to know on a cell-by-cell -cell level what makes the cancerous cells different to its neighbors and what, what's happening at a gene expression level, right? Um, and there are a number of companies and platforms that uh, specialize in helping with the service uh, that's to isolate single cells or a collection of cells from a particular tissue type. Um, and uh, they use uh, microfluidics and they use my, uh, laser capture micro dissection. So they, they basically use lasers to cut off small sections of um, tissue so that you can get right down to a very small handful of cell population. You can have up to hundreds of cells in a single experiment. And it offers a lot of um, spatial and cellular context of cells with their transcriptome. So what does that mean? So spatial meaning how does it relate to other cells that are around them? Um, so in the example I just gave, you could have uh, you could have a cancerous population and a non-cancerous population, or you could have a junction where you have two different tissue types. Um, so somewhere in the abdomen where you have two organs that are in close proximity, you could see how those two cells communicate uh, and how, how their different uh, gene expression profiles look. Those are all possible. Um, so this is just a, a very simplified pipeline of some of the services that these companies offer. Um, so it starts with extracting uh, a specimen from the human host. Sometimes it can be a blood, blood specimen, sometimes it can be a tissue biopsy. This is usually done by professional uh, medical 
medical times I can safely collect the specimen for you. Um, and uh, this is a single cell pipeline. Um, it's <coughs> Uh, there are a number of different uh, fluorescent tags that can be uh, applied and you can separate out different populations based on, uh, based on uh, color profiles. And uh, at the bottom right there you can see there, there, there are cases where you have different, different populations and you can recognize different patterns within those populations, either different uh, gene expression profiles or different cells having signature uh, gene expression profiles. So it's exceedingly powerful and it's all kind of done in a all-in-one stock kind of manner. The, the specimen collection is kind of the hardest part and then once you get the specimen, these, these, um, these different pipelines, it's all uh, very, very uh, sequential and oftentimes uh, highly automated. Okay, one of the key components to any transcriptome work is uh, the validation step. So your whole transcriptome experiments uh, needs a independent technique uh, in order to validate the method. So you can't just rely on, on one technique, it needs to be backed up, corroborated by another technique. So one of the tried and tested techniques we use for gene expression is a uh, reverse transcriptor is quantitative real-time PCR. We also use in situ hybridization uh, and you can also do functional validation where you can take the organism, you expecting an up or down regulation, you uh, knock down um, or uh, knock down that, that gene, so you basically take that gene out of the picture, you see is the phenotype as we expect, and then you put that gene back in the system and does it go back to normal. Proteomics as well, so if you're expecting a certain gene expression profile at the RNA or transcriptome level, is that reflected when you look at now the protein level? Validation is exceedingly important, especially if you have very small amounts of specimens or your specimen is exceedingly rare. So we see that a lot uh, back at our campus where patients' uh, specimens are uh, very precious and hard to come by. Um, so any experiments we do where we're seeing changes in gene expression profiling, we definitely want to validate it with one of these other techniques <coughs> to make sure that the claims we're making are substantiated by other sources as well. Uh, your choice of target is very important when you're doing your validation. So your sequence depth needs to be considered. Uh, your pathway relevance, so where does the gene fit in in terms of the particular biological pathway it's doing, what is its function, um, is it one of the end products, is it one of the catalysts, is it a middle product, where does it fall in the pathway. Um, Getting hold of new biological replicates is always useful and seeing, okay, are we seeing a similar or the same um, gene expression phenomenon in different biological uh, samples or is there some variation there? Um, so this is, this is just an example <coughs> uh, of, of a, of a Pipeline, you, you don't need to necessarily have, have a lizard in this situation, but they're looking specifically at the heart tissue and the and muscle tissue um, and bone and cartilage, and they are um, taking through this entire pipeline and they, they're wanting to see okay, um, is there a difference in gene expression between uh, these two tissue types and under different conditions? And all of these kind of approaches are very much possible. So this, this, we're, we're getting towards the end here. One of the things that excites me the most uh, in the work I do with working in clinical, clinical science is looking at how this is applicable to changing the health of patients, uh, improving um, health care in general. Um, so uh, we have an example here. I hope you can all see that. Where, yeah, so we're talking in the context of using gene expression uh, in the context of HIV infection. So let's, let's assume that um, someone acquired a HIV infection 
Um, so at um, day naught would be the, the time that the event happened that they were exposed to HIV and now they, now they have the HIV in their system and it is slowly multiplying. Um, so by sort of day, day 9 to 14, uh, with the techniques we have available um, and uh, gene ex transcriptome and uh, gene expression techniques, we can quantify the viral load by 9 to 14 days. Whereas in the past, we'd have to wait much longer. We'd have to wait for day 16 for a P24 protein to start emerging in quantifiable levels. And that, in the past, used to be our number one uh, means of detecting HIV. Further, uh, by day 28, um, yeah, you can uh, you can pick you can pick up um, protein components using an antibody assay. Um, so the the idea here is by using gene expression, we can then detect HIV at a much earlier stage, which is very useful. And we're using that in a lot of our HIV viral load quantification assays. Um, that I'm involved with. Um, you also get what's called a allomap. <clears throat> um, this is a blood test. It's very useful uh, because it's non-invasive. Um, collecting blood is, is quite straightforward in the clinic. And um, it's used to find, using the principles of transcriptomics, to find a um, match for heart transplant recipients. Um, so that's that's basically mapping uh, different expression profiles to seeing how compatible you are for, for, for different tissues. Uh, you get a um, quantified score uh, which allows you to basically say with how much confidence you're either going to be accepted or rejected in terms of a, a, a donor. And it looks at a, an entire suite of about 20 genes. Then there's also this idea of personalized medicine. So saying my gene expression profile is different to yours, that's fine. But in the context of disease, we all react slightly differently, we all have different ancestry. This idea of personalized medicine is becoming um, more and more important. Uh, we also have uh, multi-gene fingerprints, so you can have a particular gene expression profile that is unique to you for a particular stage in your life, um, and that's um, that's also very important in terms of um, finding out how using that fingerprint, maybe that fingerprint, that particular fingerprint is associated with people that resist this disease. So then we can look at what makes that, what is, what makes that fingerprint different to another fingerprint and kind of home in to any genetic components that make that particular fingerprint uh, a better a better population that resists the disease and figure out more about the biology of diseases. Um, so on the right is a panel of uh, a bunch of um, different, different methods um, that summarizes what I've just spoken about. Um, and you know, just to re-emphasize that a lot of these techniques up to five years ago were just theoretical things that were spoken about. And now, we are using a lot of the, the um, ideas around gene expression in medicine to diagnose patients with HIV using far more sensitive techniques. And you can see based on that timeline, for instance, that using, getting your diagnosis much earlier means you can be put on treatment much earlier. So a lot of this stuff is theoretical, but it has, when it is used in an applied context, it has profound uh, implications in terms of understanding the biology of the world around us and in some cases improving human health. Um, so if you find any of this um, application side of um, transcriptomics and gene expression quite interesting, I encourage you to look up uh, the review stated there. Um, it has quite a nice section by section breakdowns, so you don't need to read the whole thing, you can just zoom into things that are quite interesting and you can see uh, a lot of the existing products you might maybe even recognize for all thanks to this technology and there's also a really neat section at the end where they kind of speculate where this technology is going forward.
which is always exciting. So just to summarize, <coughs> um, looking at the transcriptome and transcriptomics, uh, we, are, we can figure out how gene expression works and how this controls the phenotype in terms of physiology. So we can look at what genes are being uh, uh, overexpressed, underexpressed, or just kept, um, kept neutral. Um, the method of RNA-seq offers um, a comprehensive solution with high reproducibility, so it has, um, it has very little technical variation, uh, and it has good resolution, right? so it's quite sensitive, and you don't need as much a priori knowledge. You don't need to have knowledge of your sequence, so it's very nice when you're doing um, ventures into unknown organisms or your research question, uh, isn't quite as defined. Bioinformatics uh, around transcriptomics is challenging and, com and complex. Um, there is a lot of data that comes out of most transcriptomics experiments and it's very important to have the right bioinformatics tools in order to analyze this data. As with everything, but in particular in, in gene expression work, you need to um, really have a good think about your experimental design. Um, and you need to know how many replicates you're going to need to use, and the specimen availability, and how much RNA at the end of the day you need uh, in order to have a successful experiment. Um, and as I touched on in the last couple of slides, we are transitioning to not only using transcriptomics to understand the biology around us, but we're using transcriptomics more and more in the applied world, particularly in the field of medicine and agriculture, to improve our daily lives, uh, be it in terms of uh, figuring out which crop is more superior and why, and then focusing on those crops and, and the genes that are uh, conferring that sort of superior phenotype or looking at uh, certain aspects of the disease like in the HIV example. Uh, so with that we're finished. Um, I hope you found that interesting. There is a lot going on in the field. I hope I've been able to give you just a little flavor of what's going on and uh, I welcome any questions if you have. Thanks for your attention. Uh, okay, thanks for the